Hey guys, we're back. Um, today we're going to be going over Chapter 9, which is all on the Bill of Rights and the later amendments. Now, you guys are going to see at the very top there's no um, vocab terms. Understand, there are still important vocab terms that are littered throughout this. We just don't have them listed at the very top. Please make sure you go through and you just look for those key vocab terms because it's really important to grasping the material. Now, I have once again tricked this hall into starting off um, the, the first, going over the first and second paragraph. So, if you wouldn't mind, take it away. Okay, so when you're dealing with a constitution, if you want to make any type of change, an addition, a removal, you've got to amend the constitution. Yes. And so there's actually a two-step process in order for that to happen. And Article 5 in our U.S. Constitution actually established this process. So for step one, it's going to be proposing. Now, there's actually two ways that you can propose an amendment. And that's the main way is two-thirds of Congress, both houses, saying, okay, we want this amendment to be added. Um, mm -hmm. That's the way it's usually done. Now, we will also mention this other way that you can propose, and that's two-thirds of the legislatures or each state can actually call for a national convention. And all you need is the majority of the vote at each state for this to move into step two. Now, step two is actually ratifying or approving that amendment. Um, again, this is usually how it happens. You have the ratification by three-fourths of the state legislatures, or you'll actually have ratification by special state conventions in three-fourths of the states, mm -hmm. okay? So um, now we're going to talk about the Bill of Rights, yep. our first 10 amendments, and we're going to let Mr. Halpin talk about amendments one through three. Yes. Now, again, before we start going over those, I, I want to say it one more time because it's really important. And you guys, I guarantee you guys are going to see this at some point. Again, the Bill of Rights is only the first 10 amendments. It's not the later amendments. It's the first 10. So the first amendment we have um, goes over a couple different things. But the way we remember that in this class is the term wraps. And that's spelled with two Ps, not with one P. Now, that's the right to religion. You have the right to any religion you want or worship any religion you want. Assembly, gathering together. Press, which again, that's newspapers, social media. The government's not allowed to come in and tell you what you have to write. You're supposed to be allowed. And really, even though it's become less so today, the media really is supposed to serve as the watchdog of the government. They're supposed to be reporting on what the government's doing wrong and letting the people know. And that's why the government's not supposed to be able to get involved. Um, petitioning. So again, if I was to write a petition, it's just basically an official document. And then you get a bunch of signatures to show support for that idea. And the last one is speech. The government is not supposed to come in and say, you have to say this. Now, there are a few exceptions. I can't go into a, a crowded movie theater um, and yell bomb because it might, <laughs> it might, people might get hurt as a result of that. So there are other specific things. The government still, though, is not supposed to tell you what you have to say. Now, Amendment 2, I know this is probably Ms. Hall's favorite amendment on here. Now, this is the right to own and carry firearms. You are in this country. You will have the right to carry firearms and to carry own guns. Now, you have to go through. Um, there's special permits you have to go through, and there's things you have, training you have to go through, but you have the right to do that. Um, the next one is Amendment 3. This is no soldier in time of peace shall be quartered or sheltered at any house without the consent of the owner. Now, if you guys remember on back to chapter two, this is something that the British government did to people. And it made people really, really upset and really, really angry because a lot of people couldn't afford to house soldiers and couldn't afford to feed them. So this is something that went in um, and became an official right to ours. All right, so now let's get into the rights of the accused. In other words, when you are accused of a crime, mm -hmm. there's actually four amendments that will assist you um, with this. And I'm going to go over the fourth amendment itself. And this is basically where it brings up that if the police want to come into your home, they just can't come in. They've got to have a warrant um, special permission from a judge that's basically saying, okay, you can go in and search for this or that. Um, it, this basically is going to protect you from some type of unreasonable searches, seizures, meaning 
taking things from you. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, this is the basis of they've got to have probable cause. They can't just say, you know what? We're going to stop every other car um, when I see someone driving a red car. We're we're just going to nail them. Mm -hmm. They don't have probable cause to do that. So you've got to have reasonable grounds for for stopping them. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, again, there are some exceptions. For example, if a policeman is in a hot pursuit chasing a suspect who is fleeing from a scene, like a robbery scene, it would be unreasonable to expect the policeman to find a judge to obtain a warrant. Mm -hmm. So they're in the process. They're able to act and move on this situation. Okay? Exactly right. All right, next we have Amendment 5, which is all of the rights of the accused of a, of a crime. So the first um, one is grand jury, which this basically says you cannot be charged for murder without an indictment or 16 to 23 jurors that analyze the evidence to determine if they have enough evidence to make criminal charges against the person. Now, make sure you don't get this confused with a regular jury that listens Correct. to your case. A grand jury is a special group of people that are going to look to see if there's even enough evidence. This is this is essentially, if you really think about it, before the actual trial itself starts, this is really determining if there's enough evidence to even go to trial in the first right. place. This isn't the actual jury vote, and I'm glad you clarified that. That's good. Now, the next one right here is double jeopardy. Now, this is a really, really interesting rights that people have but basically you can't be charged for the same crime twice so say um miss hall right here is charged with murder right and she is found to be innocent of that crime they can't go back and go you know what we know she did it so we're going to go and charge her again that's not how our system works if you've already been proven innocent you can't be charged for the same crime twice. but if i went out and did another murder yes then that's a completely different case correct that's right and, that, and, that's, and that's where it gets into. You can't be charged with the same crime, but you can be charged with an additional crime or a different crime. Uh, the next one we have is self-incrimination. Now, you've probably heard this phrase on TV. I plead the fifth. All this is saying is I'm refusing to answer any questions. I'm going to remain silent. I'm not going to incriminate myself before. Now, please understand as students, you don't have this right to plead the fifth uh, when you're actually going up if you're if you're in trouble in school only. However, if you're charged with a, a big big crime or a felony, you can still play the fifth, obviously. The next one we have is due process, which this is basically this idea, and you, you've heard this in the Constitution, no person may be deprived of life, liberty, or property without this. It's basically rights that you're, you're given, um, and you can't just have those rights taken away for no reason. So in other words, they're basically steps that the law must follow for everyone. Correct. Next, and lastly, we have eminent domain. Now, this is probably before uh, before I really um, started studying this stuff, this is the thing that I, I was most surprised about, that the government could do this. But this is basically saying the government can take private property for public purposes. So, um, And they must be fairly compensated for that property, but there's stories of people who feel they weren't fairly compensated, and there's stories of people who feel they were very generously compensated. So it can, it can go both ways. It really can. So maybe the government needs property for a new highway or something along those lines, and they feel they need that property. They need to take that property. Um, you want to add to that? I know you're 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 very knowledgeable um, with eminent well, domain. Well, I mean, anything you would have. We will go over some specific eminent domain cases sure. where. You know, your mouth is going to drop open because they were able to go and basically take a whole neighborhood and yet not end up using the land. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of issues that people run into. Correct. Um, so Amendment 6, again, is another right of the accused. Um, and this one has to do with right to a speedy and public trial. Now, the thing is, though, when they say speedy, don't think it's going to happen next week because, Mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot of backlog, got a lot of crime. So it's within a reasonable amount of time. Um, You also have a right to an impartial jury, meaning let's say, for instance, I'm being accused of kidnapping. 
nobody on the jury should have been kidnapped because that person would be very biased. Exactly. If I'm, yeah, if I'm being accused of the same thing that happened to them. So they make sure that those jury members don't know me, aren't related to me, haven't had any type of experience with this, etc. cetera. Um, also right to confront the witness. Now, when we hear the word confront, we think of, ooh, that person's running up to me. No, it's technically the witnesses are on the stand and my lawyer will have the opportunity to ask them questions. Correct. Also the right to counsel. Um, counsel is another word for lawyer or attorney. And if you can't afford one, one will actually be provided. Yes, that is at state level as well as federal. I was thinking of... Uh... Mrs. Mrs. Rose Hero. Her, her, yeah, her Gideon, Gideon is her hero. Yes. Uh, next, we got Amendment 7, guys, which is the right to a jury trial in many civil cases. So, so remember, yeah. that was odd because when we say rights of the accused, we're thinking 4, 5, 6, and 7. Correct. No, it's 4, 5, 6, and 8. Very good. That are going to be our... Exactly rights. right. 7 is, is not one of those rights, again, of the accused, but it's still a very important right that you can have a jury there um, in a civil case. Next, we got Amendment 8, which this is this is probably, I think, the most interesting amendment. Um, so let's just go over it real quick. So you prohibit or doesn't allow excessive bail. So let's just say, theoretically, um, um, Miss Hall here stole a pencil again. They, the judge can't go, you know what? I'm going to charge you an $8 million bail. That's not fitting to the crime at all. You can't be charged so much that I can never potentially get out before the trial. So, again, it has to be reasonable. Um, you keep prohibits excessive fines. So, again, same example. Let's just say she's found guilty of stealing that pencil. The judge can't go, you know what? You owe the court $10 million. It's, it doesn't fit the crime at all. That pencil costs probably 3 bucks at most. So, again. It's an expensive pencil. <laughs> you, you never know. <laughs> There's some, there's some nice pencils out there. Regardless, though, and lastly, prohibits cruel and unusual punishments <clears throat> for crimes committed. So um, you no longer anymore can somebody be subjected to a firing squad. That's um, not true. Oh, really? You have one state that that is an option. What state is it? I want to say it was Delaware. I can't remember which state it is. Okay, well, let me, let, me give, let me give another one then. You, can't, you can no longer charge people to the guillotine. Which is obviously something that was used. Please tell me that's not allowed. I don't. I don't think there's any state that does that. <laughs> okay, we're just making sure. Okay. So regardless, though, there are certain punishments that you are not allowed to do. Um. And again, it's it varies state by state. Like I believe there's uh -huh. still one state that allows the electric chair. Correct. I would think there's more states than I one. I don't think. I don't think there's many. I think most states have prohibited the electric chair. Well, this uh, this is a well, bad topic. Every day, every day. I promise we will do that. We will get back to you. All right, let's go through Amendment Number Nine, guys. Rights not listed in the Constitution may still exist and belong to the people. Now, the key word here is the word rights. Again, rights not listed in the Constitution may still belong to the people. Now, Amendment Ten, powers not delegated or listed by the Constitution are reserved for the states or the people. People. <laughs> the key word there is powers. So just because the powers aren't listed in the Constitution, they still belong to the states or to the people. So the Ninth Amendment rights, Tenth Amendment powers. Correct. Okay, so how the Constitution both safeguards and limits our individual rights. And this really kind of goes back to something that you said. If, if it's something that can, like if I'm screaming fire, like you said, bomb, or mm -hmm. you know, if I scream fire in a, in a very congested area, I could create panic yep people yep. could get hurt correct like if happens at a backstreet boys concert don't don't and say the word don't say the word if in there right? I, i'm definitely going to be at a backstreet boys concert yeah. don't, don't say <laughs> if he he could get trampled if he's in the front row and and people try to rush the stage <laughs> i know what you're thinking worth it and i'll take my chances <laughs> okay um the impact of later amendments. Now, keep in mind, we have a total of 27 amendments. And how many years have we been a country? 200 and something years? And it's like, wow, we only have 27? Well, it's, you know, our Constitution's not the easiest thing 
Mm-hmm. to change, no but it's always possible. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about um, some different amendments that really impacted some groups of people. Um, so Halpin is going to talk about the Civil War amendments, which is 13, 14, and 15. Exactly right. Um, so let's go over num- amendment number 13. Naturalized in the U.S. are citizens of the U.S. and in the state for which they live. The purpose of this was to make it clear that free slaves were U.S. citizens with all rights of citizenship. Now, this kind of goes into, if you really think about it, something that we talk about in Chapter 12. If you have right now a child um, who is born in the or their parents aren't U.S. citizens, but they come over here, they'll come over here to try to make sure that their child, if they're born on U.S. soil, is a U.S. citizen. Which now, is called law of soil. Correct, exactly right. Um, now, they're, depending which political party you believe in or endorse, their people feel differently about that, whether that should be allowed or shouldn't be allowed. However, it is happening in our country right now. Now, Amendment Number 15 basically prohibited the federal and the state government from denying people the right to vote based on race, color, or previously have been a slave. Now, there's obviously a notable exception in this amendment, which there was a group of people who still did not have the right to vote, and that was women at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's about what we're going to transition into right now. Right. Now, the three amendments that I'm going to talk about to finish this chapter up is going to be three amendments that really expanded democracy in our country for lots of people. So like the 19th Amendment, again, that one was the one that gave the women the right to vote. And you'll hear that term suffrage, um, and that happened in 1920. Um, Amendment 24 basically ended up uh, prohibiting or not allowing any state from requiring people to pay a poll tax in order to vote. A poll tax is exactly what it, well, not a poll, but you. the polling booth is where you go. And then, of course, a tax is a fee. So um, that was basically mm-hmm. not allowed. Correct. Um, and and again, ahead. these were, this was a very, this was a, a, a way in which People tried to prevent um, African Americans from voting at the time because, again, they just didn't have a lot of money. Um, usually, because most of them were slaves before, and um, they were they were not given great jobs as a result of it, and so they didn't have a lot of money. And so, people who made laws in the South at the time put poll taxes on there because they knew that, again, these people wouldn't be able to vote. So, and that's, that's, that's the logic behind the reason they did it. Right. And the reason why you also had these other acts, ACTS, come through um, was to kind of patch the holes because you had your southern states that were not necessarily abiding by the federal law. So, for instance, um, basically in the 1960s, you had three acts that actually came out. The Civil Rights Act of, ni- of 1964, that prohibited discrimination in restaurants, hotels, right. and different forms of employment mm-hmm. based on your uh, race, sex, religion, or ethnic origin. Okay. Now, in 65, they passed another one called the Voting Rights Act. And this basically echoed the 15th and the 24th Amendments in that it basically, again, prohibited the poll tax and racial discrimination in voting. Correct. So um, it also permitted special federal officials to register voters. Um, And then, of course, you had 1968, the Civil Rights Act. Um, It prohibited racial discrimination in the sale or rental of a house. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the 26th Amendment actually lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. And I know there's a there's a phrase that's associated with this amendment. You want you want to go over over that phrase? Is it so basically old enough, old enough to die, old enough to vote? People were, at this time especially, people were going over to Vietnam, and they were putting their lives on the line. And it was, it was a very, very um, difficult war for people. And the argument was, if you're old enough to serve your country, why do I not get a say in 
who's running the government. Why do I not get that say? So again, that's part of the, the pressure to change the age from 21 to 18 and why it happened. And that's basically it. Okay. All right. We hope you guys enjoyed the video. We'll see you soon.